We are at the Data Science Summit second edition now. And what has changed since last year? Well, uh, one big thing has changed, and that was a motto uh, that we had arrived at that we thought we should have for this year's Data Science Summit, AI first. And we got a lot of questions from the audience. Um, what does AI mean? Can you do AI without data? And a lot of these types of things that we'll go through tomorrow in the sit-down panel. But I want to give a little bit of a primer. Uh, and I think that the questions that have to do with AI are very similar to the types of questions that we had regarding data science only a year ago, or a couple of years ago at most. What is a real data scientist? Uh, the thing is, I don't think we actually answered that question, but I don't think anybody asked that question anymore because there is enough of a type of variety in every company and in every individual that it can fit very many different types of data scientists. There can be data science that are, uh, scientists that are uh, more applied and into the data engineering aspect or that are very mathematical or anything. And there's room enough for all of those data scientists under the umbrella title of data scientist. Now nobody asks it anymore. It's more relevant to know how is data science going to be applied in your company. So that's not a discussion. And now it's the same thing with AI. What is AI? Well, the answer is there's going to be lots of different types of AI. But if, for the sake of discussion, we're going to define it today, uh, a couple of years ahead of time, I think there are two definitions of AI that are uh, important. The first definition of AI is a technical one. And that is where AI is today in terms of its technical capabilities. I don't know if anybody recognizes these pictures. These are bedrooms, pictures of bedrooms, except they're not. These are some of the first example generated images by uh, uh, adversarial networks that came out a couple of years ago. Adversarial networks are a way of setting up your neural networks so that they fight against each other and uh, generate content. <clears throat> And uh, these ones were trained in specific to generate pictures of bedrooms. They're very small, they're not very nice, but you can sort of see maybe that there's a bed and some other stuff, and it looks sort of neat. Okay, a couple of years ago, fast forward to today. Where are generative adversarial networks? Now, this is a video that uh, we could play in theory, but perhaps we won't. <laughs> and you'll have to trust me on this description. This is a video of Obama speaking, and if I hadn't told you that it was entirely generated by adversarial networks, you wouldn't have noticed, likely, until perhaps a couple of minutes in, and you would have seen that when he says F, the lip didn't really close completely as it should. This is state of the art today. It was shown at SIGGRAPH 2017. We have, in other words, videos that are entirely synthetic and entirely believable. What does that have to do with your business? Well, maybe this specific application of adversarial networks is not applicable to the way you distribute electricity in the grid or the way you sell clothes off the shelves. But it's, it shows two things. It shows that machine learning has passed this threshold where it's not just about increasing your lift on, on an algorithm by a couple of percent. It's enabling entirely new technologies and more importantly, new services to be developed. So. This brings me to my second definition of AI that I think is much more important, which is AI, originally the acronym stood for artificial intelligence, as you all know. But I think a more useful way of looking at it is a, thinking of it as augmented intelligence. It's where you can provide a service to somebody that is intelligent enough that somebody values it. You know, those we were talking a couple of years ago about um, being data first, and people were really stuck on the idea of monetizing data and selling the data. Like, how can we turn this into a, a tar file and send it off and maybe somebody can uh, sell ads given this data? That's not what it's about. It's about in building a new service and a new value that's intelligent and useful to the customer. And the go-to example is always Uber, but that's because Uber doesn't have any assets and the data is not the asset. It's the service that's provided to the customer in an intelligent way. And so what's going to happen now when new services are offered to customers? What I want to show now is that with AI, things are going to change, and they're going to change very fast. So one, two. Should I click one more time? Ah, oh, he's outside. Well, while we're waiting for our technical assistant here, you will have to trust me on what's on the next slide. Could you uh, forward the slides? doesn't seem to be going forward. Advancing. 
There we go. All right, so this is a map of the United States, 1980, what the most common jobs in the United States were. The blue stuff, if you can't read it, the text is a bit small, is secretary, and the green stuff is farmer. So fast forward to today, and secretary is not quite as prominent anymore. And that's because Word does a lot of the stuff that secretaries used to do. We're, uh, not Word, uh, Outlook. But a lot of the, that stuff that secretaries used to do is automated now by machines. We don't need somebody to book meetings for us anymore. We don't need somebody to look things up. We have the internet for that. And so that's changed quite a lot. And that's from 1985 to today. 40 years, it's quite a lot. But if you look at what's on this map today, the most common job in the United States, over 300 million people, is truck drivers. The second most common job is farmers. And I don't know if you saw some of the news from uh, Memphis Meats. Memphis Meats is a company in the US right now that produces synthetic meat. Within five years, we will have hot dogs that are synthetic, grown with synthetic protein. Within 10 years, we will have synthetic fish. And in 15 years, we'll have synthetic T-bone steaks. What does that do to the farmer job? This is not really, I'm not trying to say this to say that uh, the world is going under. But what can happen is that a relatively small change in the market, self-driving cars, synthetic meat, or AI-driven trading, could make a big change very fast, potentially. And just because you're a big player or a small player doesn't make a difference. Because now, what the cloud has done is enable a small company to scale to global proportions in very little time. The data is out there, and the computing resources are out there. If you think that AI is hyped right now, it is. And for good reason. Very much the same way that the internet was hyped at the end of the 90s. In fact, it was a bubble. And so is AI. There's a really great commercial by IBM from the late 90s where there's this business guy and he's sitting and, uh, and there's a programmer across. Both are dressed spiffy like IBM people. And the business manager is reading presumably Bloomberg or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> it says here, it says here that every new company is going to be on the internet. We got to be on the internet. And he looks up at the programmer, and the programmer says, why? And doesn't say. And that's the joke. I think now, afterwards, we can sort of laugh at that. Uh, nobody thinks that Amazon is a joke anymore in retail. The internet was a bubble. It was hyped. And it changed the world. And it's the same thing with AI. The problem is, are you going to implement AI in a way that's meaningful, or are you just going to get an AI as your alibi for also being on the hype train. Uh, another thing that's important now is that the difference between small companies and big companies when it comes to applying AI. This is uh, Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired Magazine. He's in the middle of it. And he has a really nice quote, which is, the business plan of the next 10,000 success successful startups is going to be X plus AI, cows plus AI. Uh, baby toys plus AI, whatever it is. Smart clothes that measure your body temperature plus AI. Games plus AI, and so on and so on and so on. That is the way to predict what the next new sources of innovation are going to be. And it's not just the small companies that are trying to bet on it. The big behemoths are pivoting, and for good reason. They don't pivot like this for nothing. The last time this happened was when mobile was the next big thing. And it's changed the way we communicate. Uh, Eric Schmidt, love him or hate him, he has uh, also a nice quote, which is that every huge successful IPO in the next five years will build on AI and cloud computing. So the takeaway, uh, what I want you to have in mind now is that if you're a small company, you have the world uh, to gain. And if you're a large company, you, have, uh, uh, a, you are a step ahead because you have more data, you have more industry experience, and it doesn't take a lot to capitalize on these new AI innovations.